I'm back with Dr. Larry Crabb, author of the book, 66 Love Letters, A Conversation with God that Invites You Into His Story. Uh, Larry, we were talking about the Apostle Paul last segment. We get into the book of Romans, which is a really a profound theological mm. letter, mm -hmm. love letter. It's, yeah. Uh, if, if you want to continue the analogy of love letters, this one's getting down to, okay, so how are we going to make a life together? I mean, this is, this is, this is pretty heavy stuff at, in some places. But you, you rightly highlight, I think, from my perspective in, in, in my study of Romans, a critical question in Romans from uh, chapter 1 through chapter 3. You've summarized it. Basically, how can I, a lost and guilty sinner stand before a just and holy God. That is the question. That is the question. Because you, you, you said, and rightly, the beginning of uh, this, this series last week, and it's the beginning of the book too, that the ultimate issue here is holiness. Yes. It, yes. It, God is holy and He wants to make us holy. Yeah. The problem is we are so unholy. Yes. And the great difficulty is that so often in our culture, we see our worst problem not to be unholiness, but to be woundedness. Right. And therefore, we assume that what we need is sympathy and support as opposed to forgiveness and reconciliation. And I wish that um, I were asking the question more profoundly every day. I wish that the entire Church of Jesus Christ were asking the big question, how can I, a guilty sinner, stand in the presence of a holy God? That should be a question we ask every day, not just the day you become converted. I heard a Lutheran theologian once put it very well. He said, sanctification is the art of getting used to justification. Mm. I love that thought, mm. you know, that every day um, I, I still have some self-centeredness in me and I suspect you probably do too in some ways that we don't even recognize. Mm. So therefore the blood of Jesus is as necessary for me today as it was the day I got converted when I was eight years old, 110 years ago or so it seems. And um, for me to, to realize that the book of Romans is basically God saying to me, I got you covered. Yeah. I got you covered. And for the sake of, of uh, any viewer who or, or a reader of your book who, who, who maybe hasn't encountered the concept of holiness before. Um, how, how would you, you know, in popular or layman's language, describe the meaning of holiness? Would, would you say it's healthiness? Would you say it's, it's freedom from uh, flaw? What, what, would, what would you say it is? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with the word healthiness yeah. because as a psychologist, we define health as feeling good all the time. Right. And I'm not sure if that's at all the okay, so proper that's, definition so, of it. So, as a psychologist, uh, as someone who's just spent four years going through the Bible, uh, what would your perspective be on holiness and its meaning? I would contrast the relational nature of God with my relational nature from birth. And the way I'd put it is this, that God in His relational nature is committed to the well-being of another at any cost to Himself. Right. And my nature is unholy. I'm committed to my well-being at any cost to somebody else. And my wife and I are having a conflict. I want her to see it my way so I can be happy. That's unholy. When I'm raising my children, when our, my two boys that are now adults are 41 and 39, but when, they're, um, when they were little and our younger, older son rather rebelled rather seriously, there was something in me that just was determined to have this kid reflect well on me because I write books on this stuff. <laughs> you know? Now, is that coming out of love for him or is that coming out of my need for recognition and yeah. looking good? Yeah. I can recall giving a seminar in parenting when my two kids were eight and ten years old sitting in the audience. And this is, I should never say this, but I'm going to. Yeah. I went to them before I got up to speak on parenting and I put my hands on their neck lovingly, of course, squeezed just a little bit and said, for the next hour, you guys are going to be good. Is that clear? <laughs> <laughs> now, I think that's, we could laugh about it, I think it's worth a laugh, but that's it's also... very like, unholy, Larry. It's unholy. Very unholy. Well, I think it is. Yeah. It violates the no. nature of God. It's no. relational sin. We think of sin as just doing bad things. Uh, Jim, I don't do a lot of bad things. Yeah. I've never had an affair in my life. I'm yeah. going to go to my grave never having, yeah. never having had an affair, I believe. So therefore, I guess I'm not a sinner. No, wait a minute. There's relational sin. Yeah. When do I use somebody else for my well-being? God doesn't do that. But I do, that's unholiness. Yeah. And God says, I'm going to forgive you for all of that. You violated my nature, and I'm going to give you my nature. So you can not only be forgiven and pardoned, but your paralysis that sin has brought about can result in power. You're free to live a whole different way. A whole mm. new way to live is available to you. Mm. And my thought is, huh, do I really want it? And the clearer I see what the gospel is, the clearer I see what sin does, self-centeredness does, the more I say, you know, I really do want the benefits of the gospel. It seems so clear, and yet you make the point, and it's so so true again and again. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it's in, in your coverage of uh, First Corinthians, you bring it out that 
as clear as the message is, people, for whatever reason, continue to balk. Yes. yes. And and uh, you you say in your uh, overview of uh, the First Corinthians love letter that Paul continued to tell the Lord's story of love to quarrelsome, arrogant, and selfish people. Mm -hmm. and he never gave up on them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there comes a point when, you know, a preacher especially <laughs> wants to just say, well, okay, if that's the way it is, you're a bunch of stiff necked people, forget it, I'm out of here. I'm going to change churches. I'm going to change churches, whatever. But, but, but Paul obviously saw beyond that, which again indicates the fact that he was supernaturally invested with something from the Lord. Because yeah. the Lord, like with Hosea, sees the big picture and sees the end from the beginning, right? It's all a question of vision. Yeah. I think Paul had a vision for what God could do because he saw what God had done in his life and he knew what God was up to and therefore he had a vision that God is up to changing people. Think of the verse in Galatians 4.19 where Paul said, I'm in the pains of childbirth which I don't think Paul knew anything about firsthand, but apparently, you know, but apparently it's rather painful. Right. And he was saying, I'm in the pains of giving birth until what? Until Christ is formed in you. And if you're going to be stubborn, recalcitrant, and stiff-necked and all the rest of it, I believe God has the power to work with you. I'm not going to give up on you. I, I wanted so much when I, uh, I was in full-time counseling. I had some people that I thought, oh, go see somebody else. I don't want to mess with you. And I thought, no, no, that's not God's attitude toward people. I've got to stay involved believing God can do something. I'm working with people right now that are just as blind as they can be. I was talking to one of them on the phone just last night. And part of me says, oh, do you have to call and want more time with me? I'm tired of working with you. And then the battle begins and I got to learn how to dance and say, no, wait a minute. The dance of the Trinity is, I believe that God can do a work on you. I'm going to pour myself into you a little bit more. As you were just telling me about this person who called you last night, this uh, image flashed through my mind of Richard Dreyfuss <laughs> and what about Bob? Yeah. Oh, dear. I remember the movie well. Every, everybody can see what about Bob. Yeah, what about Bob? We got a lot of Bobs in our life. I was going to say, every pastor has a Bob or and two. I wonder who I'm a Bob to. And I, I, that's right. And, I, and I'm sure that psychologists have a Bob or two as well. What, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I mentioned Corinthians, but moving back to Romans for a minute. Um, as you studied uh, Romans and as you you know, prayed the prayer again, Lord, what do you want me to learn here in Romans? What, what was the overriding uh, lesson from Romans for you? That if truth is not living, you haven't discovered truth. Uh. That if all you do is memorize your doctrinal statement, mm -hmm. and I'm all for doctrinal statements. Yeah. I think truth matters. Don't yeah. misunderstand. Yeah. Orthodoxy matters a yeah. lot. Whatever God said is true, you better learn what it yeah. is. But don't stay in the library. Get out of the library, out into the meadow, and realize that the truth of God is living truth. It's not just academic truth. And until you learn to smell the roses, until you learn to realize that you're not going to capture the deep things of God simply with the intellect. Use your intellect. Use your brain power, of course. But don't think of Romans as a book where you just take notes. Right. Think of Romans as a book that you take notes, but then you move into the reality of what it means to live this incredible life that God has given us. There's a, there's a new way to live that the doctrine of redemption makes possible. So I don't want Romans just to be a, a textbook. Yeah. I believe it's a love letter. Yeah, what's he say in Romans 12, um, 1 and 2? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your bodies a living, a living sacrifice. sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Be transformed by renewing the Renewing of your mind, that you may be able to, actually I think in the Greek, test and approve yes. what is a good and acceptable good and perfect, and perfect, will, perfect of will of God. Uh, it's a powerful book and you captured it well. You, you want this book, I know you do. Uh, and um, it's called 66 Love Letters, A Conversation with God That Invites You Into His Story. 